pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. I'm very excited. If you've, if you've kept track with anything, some of you weren't able to make it to the conference this weekend, you tuned into the live stream. If you missed some of those, they're on YouTube, so you can go back and watch them at your convenience. But I'm incredibly excited to have Dr. Warren Lamb. He is, uh, what is your exact position? Are you senior fellow emeritus guru? What are, what are you? And a biblical counselor. He's a Bible teacher and biblical counselor, but he's over Truth and Love Biblical Counseling Ministries. Um, he actually serves in leading through a lot of the uh, programs in order to get people certified and equipped for biblical counseling. I've gone through one of those, and there are probably about five people in this room right now who are signed up to go through this program as well. It's all online that we're able to do. Uh, it is excellent material that's really challenged and encouraged me and helped me learn what it is to engage with people in their struggles. And so I'm very excited for everything that the Lord has taught him that he can come today and impart it to us. So if you haven't heard him speak yet, you don't know if he's any good, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you he is. Normally we hold off on applause because we don't know. I'll go ahead and tell you we can clap for this guy. It's good. So let's welcome Dr. Warren Lamb. I'm going to be here a while, so if you have to go potty, let's get that done now. Okay. <laughs> One of the things I'm most known for saying is that words matter. I'm going to make a very bold statement this morning. I want to share with you the four most important words in the Bible. That's a pretty bold statement, right? What's interesting is that when you look at the Bible, the word of God. When you look at the Hebrew text, there are 77,000 or 79,817 Hebrew words in the Old Testament. When you look at the Greek, there's only 5,437 words, but they're used 138,162 times and 50 or 319 of those words are used more than 50 times, and they comprise 79.92% of the New Testament. Isn't that amazing? 319 words comprise the bulk of the New Testament. What's fascinating to me about that is we're not able to directly translate from the Hebrew and the Greek into English. So when you look at like the New American Standard, you look at the Old Testament, you have 609,269 Old Testament words. 179,011 words in the New Testament. So you've got 788,280 words in the English Bible of the New American Standard. That's a lot of words. And, but I'm here to, to help you lay hold of the four most important words in the Bible. They're words that have transformed my life and the lives of thousands of people that I've seen. They've transformed your life, whether you realize it or not. Some of you may have heard of Charles Evan Hughes. He was a former Supreme Court Justice and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He'd been a, he, a 4,000 vote shift. <coughs> Woodrow Wilson ran for re-election, would have made him a Republican president instead of Woodrow Wilson, the president for a second term. His most incredible minds. He had a photographic memory. It just, it, and he didn't have allies. He didn't have people to, to speak to. He didn't counsel with other people because there weren't any other brilliant minds around. And that sounds kind of arrogant, but it was just the fact. He was asked, he served as a U.S. ambassador, and he went to to South America and they were negotiating with a, what they call a Pan-American treaty. And he told his interpreters, he said, I don't need a running translation, but as soon as the other negotiator uses the word but, tell me everything he says after that. But is one of the most powerful words that we can ever use.
we can we use it in very powerful it's, we call it an eraser word it erases everything that went before it you don't want to hear I love you but <laughs> I'm, I, I really appreciate everything you've done today but we don't like that word sometimes but sometimes it's one of the most powerful words in the Bible My text this morning is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. And see if you can pick up the four. I gave you one. Let's see if you can pick up all four. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit of the that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. For grace you have been saved and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of your works, that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I bet you you figured out those four most important words, didn't you? Four most important words in all of Scripture are but God and in Christ. When we take a look at the book of Ephesians, it was one of the first books that I read more than once when I got converted at 31. I was fascinated by the Bible because it suddenly made sense. And I don't know how many times, probably... 45 or 50 times I read through the book of Ephesians. I was reading it over and over and over. Because the book of Ephesians is a mini course in theology. Right? Uh, We're told who we are. We're told how we came to be as we are. We're told what we will be. Uh, We're told what we're supposed to do now in, in light of that. It's just this rich and magnificent blend of Christian doctrine and Christian duty, Christian faith and Christian life. Um, it tells us what God has done and, and what he's done through Christ and what we are to be and to do. What's really interesting, too, is that when we look at the Bible in its, total, in its entirety, what is it there for? How many of you heard that the Bible is God's love letter? Right? <laughs> the Bible is God's resume. It's his resume. If you complete a resume, what are you doing with that? What are you, when you send a resume in, what are you communicating? You're communicating what you're about. That's what the Bible is. It's God's resume. Does he talk about love in there? Sure he does. But that's not all he talks about. He talks about his holiness and his righteousness and his justice and his judgment. He talks about all of those things. So while the postmodern view is his love letter, that may be nice. That's not all that it is. What's important about that is the Bible, the book of Ephesians, tells us who is God. Who is God? What has he done? Why has he done it? How has he done it? And what does that all mean? That's what theology is. It's all right here. When you take a look at the two-word phrase, but God, very, very powerful phrase. But God occurs 72 times in the New Testament, but the Lord occurs 42 times. Put that together, that's quite a bit, right? But even more important than that is the two words in Christ. 
in Christ and its cognates, that's in him, by him, through him, of him, in Christ and his cognates occur 164 times in the New Testament, 35 times in the book of Ephesians alone. It is the two-word summary of the New Testament. And what's really interesting is there's two Greek words for the word in. There's eis, E-I-S, and en, E-N. Okay? Well, E-I-S, eis means I'm in Portage, Wisconsin. But if you say I live in Portage, Wisconsin, that's the E-N. E-I-S means I, well, my location. But in is, E-N is I abide. I abide here. So I'm not just visiting, it's not just a location. This is where I live. So when it talks about being in Christ, and we're gonna talk about this in a minute, this is, those are the two most significant words this side of the empty tomb. But let's talk about but God first. There are, when you take a look at the, the instances of but God in scripture, they're very powerful. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. That was our state of being. There was nothing we could do about it. It says, but God did what? He made us alive together in Christ, in Christ. What's interesting is when you take a look at but God in the Old Testament, do you ever feel overwhelmed? Do you feel, ever feel like you just can't make it? Do you ever feel, maybe even as, as a result of your own choices? You ever feel that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, do you know we're not alone? We're not alone. If you look at Psalm 73, verses one and two says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Verse 21, when my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. Some translations say stupid. I was like a wild beast before thee. You ever felt like that? What an idiot, right? You ever feel like that? You make a decision and you, you, oh, can't believe I was such an idiot. 23, nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast taken hold of my right hand with a counsel that will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. But you, O Lord, but you, O Lord, have done this. Even though I've done this and this is the result and I feel completely overwhelmed by it, you, O oh Lord, but you, O oh Lord. How about our friend Job? You guys know Job, right? Poor guy. Do you know, I, as I was studying the Bible, I thought, man, I would hate to be one of God's favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, there was Cain and Abel was a favorite. That didn't turn out well. Joseph, that didn't turn out well. Jesus, that really didn't turn out well. Job, that didn't turn out well. But if you look at Job 23, if you look at verse 8, it says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. Backward, I cannot perceive him. Do you ever feel like God is just like not there? You're praying and your prayers bounce off the ceiling? When he acts on the left, I can't behold him. When he, he turns to the right, I cannot see him. I love this. But he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his path. I have kept his way and not turned aside. One of the hardest things for us to do when things are difficult is to hold on and believe. Do we really believe and trust in this God of the Bible? Do we really believe and trust in that? Now, we know that God is full of wrath against sin. When we talk about this, we mentioned it this weekend, 
Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he is under extreme emotional, mental, spiritual pressure. This angst. And he says, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup be taken from me. Today it would be like, Dad, this is really a bad idea. I really don't want to do this. But it's really interesting. He says, but I'm going to surrender my will to yours. And the, the cup he's talking about is actually Old Testament language. What we would call Old Testament language. He's not concerned about the betrayal. He's not concerned about being exhausted. He's not concerned about being ridiculed, his beard being pulled, spit on, beaten. He's not even concerned about being crucified. That cup is the cup of God's wrath. And God's wrath against all human sin was going to be poured out on Jesus, the Son of God. He knew what that meant. But God, in his mind, my my father, I know, will take me through. And if he hadn't done that, we would have no in Christ. But because he did that, we have the in Christ. One of the primary areas of counseling that I do is with survivors of abuse. Think about Joseph. Joseph was a favorite of his father and of God. Well, that didn't turn out well for him because it made him an enemy. His brothers are so jealous and you can't hardly blame them, right? They were born ahead and, you know, their mother was the one that their father had married first. But you got the child, firstborn child of the second wife. They're both usurpers. We're entitled to all of this. Who is he? And they t- saw an opportunity to get rid of the problem. And they said, let's kill him. He was an enemy to be destroyed. But the one of the brothers goes, hey, look, there's Ishmaelites. They're slave traders. Let's sell them. We can make a buck. So he went from being a human being to being a thing. And that's what we see with abuse survivors. They've been objectified and they're no longer people. They're just things. He was sold as a slave. All kinds of horrible things happened to him. You know, Joseph is one of the four people in Scripture that God never says anything negative about. There's nothing negative ever said about Joseph and his attitude, his behavior, his heart. Even when he's given an opportunity to take advantage of his employer, owner, Potiphar, he doesn't take it. He says, how could I do this? I can't betray betray God. I can't betray my, my Lord. I can't betray my employer. He was lied about. Ended up in prison. He got forgotten there. Boy, this uh, really signed me up to be one of God's favorites, right? No. <coughs> Excuse me. What's interesting is he stayed faithful in that, because why? Where was his focus? On God, not his circumstances. Do you know but God that well? Can we look in Genesis 50:20. All of this horrible stuff has happened. His scoundrel brothers are still lying to him. Oh, before dad died, he said he wanted to make sure that you covenanted with us to not do us any harm. Joseph's surprised and heartbroken. He says, all this evil that you plan against me, he says, but God, there it is, but God meant it for good. You may have people in your life that hate you, despise you, seek to, to destroy you. Okay, but God, if you're his, if you are in Christ, you're his, you're, you're secure, you're safe. 
He will take you through that. But God, it tells us that he came to seek and to save the lost. You know, you seeker-friendly churches? You guys have heard of those? That always confounded me. That always made me confused. Right? Because it says Jesus is a seeker. None of us searches after God. Okay. And Jesus seeks and saves the lost. So seeker-friendly churches. Jesus is welcome there? But that's not the focus, is it? It's on other people. It becomes a marketing ploy. Do you know you don't have to sell, package, market the gospel? According to Colossians 1, it has power to, to impact the world all on its own. The fact that God says, I want to use you to spread the gospel. I don't have to, but I choose to. I'm inviting you to partner with me in this. That's amazing. Our condition was hopeless. We had no awareness that we needed a savior. I can remember what it was like. I was lost. I was angry. I, was, I had two emotions, angry or very angry. <laughs> or nothing, right? When, after I first got saved and started doing some of the healing work I needed, I, had all, I was like going through puberty. I had all these things I was feeling. I had no idea what they were. That still happens sometimes. Um, because my wife will say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I don't know. Well, could it be this? Could it be that? I don't know. Well, pray about it. And she prays about it. And eventually we come to figuring out what is, what's happening. It's coming more and more and more awake as time goes on. But I can remember when that that first started to happen, I thought, I feel out of control. I don't have control anymore. That's what the anger was about. It helped me feel in control. Or numbing myself made me feel in control. I don't know if any of you are like that, but it's really a bad choice. It's a bad path to follow. But as I learned to trust the but God and in Christ, but God in Christ, I really started paying attention to that. And, you know, we said Ephesians 2, but one of the amazing things is in Ephesians 1, Remember, in Christ is more times in the book of Ephesians than it is in any other book of the Bible. But it's interesting in chapter 1, and, you know, I don't know if Pastor Jeremy has shared this with you, but verse 3 through 14 in Ephesians 1 is the longest single sentence in Greek. It's like, take a breath, Paul. There's no punctuation in there. It's all one big, there's no verse divisions. It's just one big long sentence. But he moves into the second part after that. He, in verse 15, he says, for this reason. And then he drops down in verse 18. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Listen to this. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. Here it comes. When he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places and far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age and in the age to come. The power of God that is at work in everyone who is in Christ is resurrection power. It's ascension power. And it's dominion power. That's his power that's at work in anybody that's in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're a brand new believer or you've been a believer forever and ever, Amen. That power is at work and available to every single one of us. Now, it's not ours to wield. We have access to that in the Father through Christ. One of the things I like to share with people is when you've been adopted by God according to Romans 8, when you've adopted by God as his son or daughter, you immediately have a spiritual big brother in Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't have a big brother, but I was a big brother. Well, I am, I guess. And I know what that feels like. 
Anybody have a big brother that you could count on? Anybody be a big brother that people could count on? Right? And I'm sorry if you had a horrible big brother. Big brothers kind of roll that way sometimes. Well, because the new, new kids that come in are usurpers. They're taking all the love and affection and toys and food and all that. Right? That's our jealousy as rebellious human beings. But to, to know that you've got somebody in your corner. And when you take a look at the, the in Christ in the New Testament, they're amazing. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. So we were talking about this this weekend. What is your identity in? Your identity in your failures of the past, your sins of the past, or the harm that's been done to you? Or is your identity in Christ? Because all that stuff is not you. You are brand new. That's what is true. You, have, you get to choose. Am I going to believe the truth or am I going to believe the lies? Because the enemy is not going to, oh, you're in Christ now, okay, I'm going to leave you alone. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Think about this logic of progression. The enemy of our souls hates God. He hates specifically Jesus Christ. He hates those created in the image of God, which is all of us, and he even hates more those who are in Christ. He hates you. You have the worst enemy in the universe, but you have the greatest advocate and savior in the universe too. Are you going to believe that? Are you going to live as if that's true? Because it is. You know, we kind of kind of smart out. We say, well, I don't believe in gravity. Yeah, yeah, you do. You see something teetering like this on the counter. You're going to try and grab it. Why? Because you know, you trust gravity is going to suck that thing off the counter and make it crash on the floor. Right? If you didn't believe in gravity, if you stumble, you trip a little bit, and you take those three giant steps, don't know whether you're going to plunge on your face or regain your balance, why are you fighting to regain your balance if gravity isn't a real thing? So we live based on what we believe to be true. Do you really believe that you are in Christ? What if you carry horrible shame? What if you carry horrible shame from your past? Either things you've done, things that have been done to you, or a combination. Well, it says he bore our shame on the cross. Not just our sins, but he bore our shame. One of the most powerful in Christ verses in Scripture is Romans 8 verse 1. If anyone is in Christ, what? There is no condemnation. So if you're hearing a voice of condemnation, that's not God's voice. That's the voice of the enemy of your soul. Don't listen to him. He's lying to you. Don't listen. If you're feeling condemned, that is not God's voice. If you have been adopted by God, as his child, the voice that says you're a worthless piece of garbage, you're never going to make it, you'll never measure up, God will never love you, that's all lies. Don't listen. But God in Christ. I was dead in my trespasses sin, but God made me alive together in Christ. And guess what else he did? He raised us up. There's that resurrection power, right? And seated us with him in the heavenly realms. That's that ascension power. All for what? To one day share his glory with us. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, right? Well, Romans 5 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified, that means it's done. We have peace with God. You stand in God's peace. God says, Jeremy, you, me, we're cool. That's what God says. We stand, and we stand in his grace. Oh, God, I need more grace. He says, you're, right in, you're standing right in the middle of it. All of that it points to, and all that's in what we call the indicative. That's all in what's been done. And it points to what? And we exult 
in the future glory. That's what our hope is in the future glory. One, God has invited us to one day share in his glory in Christ. That's our destiny. But God in Christ. We were enslaved to sin, but he bought us out. It was a marketplace of wickedness. Sometimes we kind of like to scan through the pages on their web, on the shopping website of that web marketplace, but we need to stay away from it because he bought us out of that. He broke our bondage. He set us free. He brought us into the truth. And if you know the truth, you are free. You're a new creation in Christ and you're free. So if, any, if you say, well, my name's, my name's Herbert and I'm an alcoholic. If you surrender your heart and life to Christ, that's a lie. That's not who you are. It may be where you're from, but that's not who you are. If the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. That's either true or it's not. That's either true or it's not. It can't be both. It's what we call a logical incoherence. And what are we free to do? What are we free for? Free to live righteously? Free to praise and worship him? Free to be truly and effectively Christ-like in the world in this lifetime? We don't have to wait. And we are made new together with Christ. We're united to him in everything. Christ indwells us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our spiritual DNA completely transforms. We are a new creation. When it says new creation, it's something that hasn't existed before. New. It's not freshening up the old, it's creating new. Where he has ascended, we are conditionally ascended as well. God sees that that's where you're going to be, that's how I see you. One of the things we have the hardest time doing is, Lord, help me see me as I see you, and as you or as you see me. Well, one of the best ways to learn to do that is ask God to help you see the others around you as he sees them. That will change your perspective. One of the passages of scripture that I really don't like. I just, uh, I don't like it because it's so, I don't want to. My fallenness. Love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you, who spitefully use you, who abuse you. Pray for them. I pray for them. Bless those who curse you. I don't want to. <laughs> okay, Lord, I don't know how to do this. Can I share with you a, a blessing prayer? We have a prayer we call the blessing prayer because we deal with a lot of people who've got horrible histories. And how do you pray for someone who's so been hurt, so hurtful, whether it's a, a parent in the past or a boss you've got right now. How do you do that? This is the prayer. Father, intervene and intercede in this person's life to such a degree and such an extent that it so transforms their character that no obstacle remains preventing you from pouring abundant blessing into their life. It's kind of like a sickum prayer. <laughs> but you pray that consistently, and you're praying for, you're not praying about. Because think about it, Jesus is being nailed to the cross. And what's very interesting is says he was saying. He didn't say it once. He was saying it over and over and over and over again. Father, be forgiving them. They don't understand what they're doing. And he prayed it over and over and over. He was praying for God's best for them, even though 
they were nailing him to a cross. I can't do that, but he can do it in me if I surrender to that. Am I ignorant of God still? No. Not completely. Was I? Absolutely. But I no longer am. But am I tempted to sin? Oh, most assuredly. Um, because temptation is common to everyone. But God is faithful. He won't cause me to be tempted beyond what I can bear without providing a way of escape. That's the trick. Take the way of escape. Don't stay in that. There's an escape hatch. Take it. Am I foolish? God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. I can be wise in my own eyes. I can try to be wise in yours. But where does God see me? What's the most amazing to me about the in Christ is that when God looks at me, he looks at me through the lens of Christ. One of the hardest things for me to learn to do was to accept God's acceptance. Accept God's acceptance. Because I know I'm not acceptable. I am not acceptable to God. In Christ, I'm not only acceptable, I'm accepted. Because he sees me with the righteousness of Christ. Now, I don't know how that works. But I'm taking that at face value. God says that that's how he sees me. Parents, grandparents, you look at your little ones. Yeah, there are times they're little scoundrels. They're born that way. We don't have to teach them. It, it, you let, when's the last time you t- heard a parent say, get over there and throw a fit on the, on the store floor? Stop sharing with your sister. You don't have to do that. Even though you see that, what else do you see? You see them through the lens of love. You see them as the joy and the delight. You see them, hopefully, for who they have the potential to one day be. Where do you think we get the ability to love our children or grandchildren that way? From our Heavenly Father. That's not something we just conjure up ourselves. I think that's one of the reasons why God gives us children and grandchildren, to teach us how to understand his love for us as, as our Heavenly Father. I don't know about you, but I could never understand why grandparents lost their minds over their grandchildren. And then I had some. Right? It was, it was, it, and if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, the things we're talking about today, yeah, you can understand the words, but they don't really make any sense. If you are not in Christ, I may as well be speaking Swahili. And I would recommend you see back in that change today, by the way. Because if those of us that are in Christ are destined to what? Everlasting life. With him. Where there's no pain, there's no hurt, there's no anger, there's no animosity, there's no tears. But what do I do in the meantime? As I surrender to the Christ who indwells me by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can say with Paul, I have been crucified with Christ, therefore it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. The life I live in the body, I live to him who died and gave himself for me, to the glory of God the Father. That's actually when I sign my emails, that's my signature, Galatians 2.20. I ain't got this. But God in Christ has got this and given it to me. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Why did he do it? Because of my good intentions? No. Of my righteousness? No. 
his grace and his kindness. He extended mercy. Because that he created me to be with him, just he created each of you to be with him. If I ask everyone in here, what is the gospel? Every one of you would give me a different answer. And you won't be wrong. But the heart of the gospel is in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Think about that. He did what needed to be done for us in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, restoring us, making possible for us to be restored to the relationship he created us to have. And then what has he said? We are Christ's ambassadors. If you are in Christ, you don't belong to you anymore. You've been bought with a price. You're his ambassador. So the prayer isn't, how do I share the gospel? Or how do I avoid sharing the gospel? Because I'm really intimidated by anybody feel that way. Lord, how do I be your ambassador? I am. How do I do that well? Because you're going to represent Christ either well or poorly. You're always representing Christ. So next time you're driving down the road and you're... It's not going to look good on your resume. You know that, right? We're always representing Christ. If we're focused, say, Lord, I am in Christ. Help me live as if that is the truth. Let people look at me and see Christ in me. I love Acts 4, verse 12. Peter and John, or Peter and James, right? They're before the Sanhedrin, they've been beaten, saying, you've got to shut up about the gospel. But they're listening to them talk, and they say, they recognize that they were unlettered and unlearned men. They'd never been trained. But they also recognize that they had been with Jesus. Do people look at us and say, they've been with Jesus? You know people like that, don't you? You know people that you, you just, they've been with Jesus because they carry Jesus with them. They show Jesus in what they do or say. Their attitude. Ask God to make you that kind of an ambassador. To really lay hold of the but God and in Christ and make that the core of your life and your relationships. Let that be your focus. Not the the physical ailments, the terminal disease, or the disintegrated family, or the abuse of the past, or failed businesses, whatever it happens to be. That's not who you are. Those are circumstances that you've, you've gone through. Those are situations that you've endured. That's not who you are. They don't get to define you unless you let them. Let the in Christ define you. That is your identity. I have a really bad time following my notes. Um, I don't even know why I bother. <laughs> it's been my problem for a long time. Um, when Pastor Jeremy asked if I would be willing to stand behind the sacred desk this morning, he said, and this is months ago, he says, so, so what's your text going to be? What is your theme going to be? I knew. I just knew. And I, as I prayed about it afterwards, I thought, Lord, why is that such a significant thing? Because when you take a look at what Christians in America are focusing on, it's not the things we need to be. It's not that the things we're focusing on and concerned about are not important. The problem is they become the most important. You know, none of those things have eternal value. None of those things have eternal value. Yeah, they're important, but not the most important. 
are we reaching the lost? Well, not if we're the frozen chosen. Right? When you take a look at the Gospels, I was I just incredible when I read the Gospels. I'm like, how did Jesus put up with the knuckleheads around him? Right? I, I love the way Mark renders the Mount of Transfiguration. When you look at the Greek, you all know the story. You know, Jesus is... Elijah and Moses show up and Jesus is transfigured before them, transformed before them. And, and it says, Peter, not having anything to say, said, <laughs> anybody? <laughs> and Jesus is like, Peter, <laughs> oh, you're not going to wash my feet. If you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part. Well, then wash all of me. Peter. But Peter was, was just like every one of us. Peter was not that special. Peter was not more special than anyone sitting in this room. Do you know that? One of my f- most, f- most favorite but God lines is Jesus is having a conversation with Peter right before his ascension. He goes, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Wouldn't that be incredible to have Jesus pray for you? Turn to Romans, or um, turn to to 1 John 2, verse 1. And I'll leave you with this. Everybody's like, he's finishing? First John two verse one. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Verse two, he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, for those of the whole world. Jesus is your advocate, your defender before the Father all the time. He prays for you. You can't have any better ally praying for you than Jesus himself. You're just as important and just as valuable to him and his kingdom as Peter himself was. So if you are in Christ, everything that was his is yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm deeply grateful and honored and humbled by the opportunity to share from your word this morning. And I pray that you'll be able to use the words I've shared to touch hearts here, to encourage, to energize, to enliven faith and faithfulness. For anyone who's come in here with a sense of hopelessness, heavy hurt, maybe even hardness of heart. I pray that you will soften and encourage that, that you will help them recognize that you created them specifically and specially to be in relationship with you and one day share in your glory. And that right now today, if they don't know you, they can. If they are not in Christ, they can be. For those that have been long-term believers, who've walked faithfully for a long time, help them not grow weary. Let our conversation today encourage and energize them to continue on. As you know, my, you know, Caleb is one of my favorite characters in scripture. He was 86 years old and he finished well. When Joshua said, you've helped us conquer the land, pick any land that you want. Like any good Marine, he said, I want the high country to kick out the giants. He finished well. Let us all carry that kind of inspiration. We don't have to give up. There's no giving up. Help us not give up because you don't give up on us. 
for those who feel lost and confused and overwhelmed by circumstance, maybe of their own doing. Help them recognize that you're right there with them. You have the answers and solutions and you're going to lead them out of that dark place. That our hope is in you and the hope we have is in your eternal glory. Help us to honor your name and reflect your glory in all we think, say, and do. Thank you for your love and grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Amen.